Hey, I'm Tim Black. Thank you so much for being here at the Tim Black at Night Show. My guest is none other than, than Ajamu Baraka, vice presidential candidate for the Green Party. Hope of, hopefully, the next vice president of the United States. That's right. That's right. Four decades he's been defending human rights. Internationally recognized as a leader of emerging human rights movement in the U.S., working to apply international human rights framework to social justice advocacy in the U.S. He's worked with grassroots activists throughout the U.S. to provide human rights training. Founding executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network from July 2004 to June 2011. Has appeared and been covered in a wide range of print, broadcast, digital media outlets, CNN, BBC, Russia Today, Telemundo, ABC, Washington Post, The New York Times, to name a few. And now, the Tim Black Show is very, very proud to present none other than the man, Ajamu Baraka, guys. Give it up for Mr. Baraka, please. Ajamu Baraka, how you doing, sir? Glad to have you back. Oh. Uh my brother, I'm really feeling good. Uh, I, I really was looking forward to, to being with you. And so I'm so happy that you have given me a, a few minutes of your time and your, your listeners' time. So I'm, I really, uh, really appreciate that. Oh, man, we're, we're very humbled and very happy here to have you to have you be able to call in. I know you got a lot going on, sir. I know there's a, it's a, it's a you, you know, you're in a battle right now. <laughs> and uh, I know, brother. But hey, you know, I'm, I'm always, always going to have time for Tim Black. Oh, wow, man. Wow. That's, that's amazing, man. You, you don't know that's such a big compliment, sir. Uh, I'm looking at I'm uh, Mr. Baraka. I didn't know about you until you were selected by Jill Stein to be her VP pick. And I got to yeah. tell you, sir, once I started looking at your background, uh, I think I speak for for pretty much everyone who's uh, taking the time to do so, sir. I'm so impressed. What has brought you to accepting the VP nomination what what made you do that because you, you're not you seem to be your background is so varied i'm just wondering what was your influence we, we know tim i mean you know i've been involved in various forms of politics for all of my adult life um you know from the time i was uh, an organizer in the south uh back in the early, late 70s and, 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 and early 80s and, and through the 80s and had a chance to work with the last surviving um uh organization that came out of the 1964 Freedom Summer, which was the Voting Education Project. Uh, and this was a project, uh, Tim, that was committed to uh, engaging in voter uh, education and voter registration, primarily throughout the, uh, the 11 states uh, in the rural South. I had a chance to, to, to get to all kinds of communities and to see firsthand the kinds of political struggles that uh, black folks and poor people were engaged in and trying to uh, empower themselves. And so I always had a, a sense of the, of the potential of the electoral process for us to uh, build alternative power uh, as part of a broader strategy for uh, the kind of a real radical change that we have to make here uh, in this country. So, you know, my life has been one of, of building, of trying to build that alternative power um, uh, and building alternative power in order to try to bring about our lasting social justice. So, you know, fast forward to 2016, uh, after, you know, years of, of organizing, years of, of, of human rights education and organizing uh, advocacy um, and writing um, Jill Stein called me and said uh, she would like uh, for me to consider uh, joining her on this uh, Green Party ticket as someone who um, brings to the ticket a uh, commitment to real radical change and who uh, is not going to be afraid of the intense uh, scrutiny uh, and attempt to, um, to undermine us that we knew was going to um, um, uh, happen as a consequence of us attempting to uh, build a real alternative to the two parties. And I thought about it, Tim, and I said, you know what? Um, this is the moment. Uh, 
2016 is a historical uh, moment for uh, really beginning to build uh, something outside of the two-party monopoly. Uh, and I, we talked two days later, and I said, uh, Joe, uh, I'm with you. Let's go ahead and, and, and do it. And, and we've been on the ride ever since. It's been like three and a half weeks now. Wow. 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 It's amazing. It's amazing. It is. Um, when I hear you talk about radical change, uh, I wonder what that means. Like, could you unpack yes. what radical change is? Well, you know, sometimes we, we, we kind of get uh, nervous when we hear that word radical, you know. And, and all radical really is, Tim, is that a, a radical is someone that attempts to go to the, to the root. Someone who looks beneath the surface. Someone who asks the critical questions. And when you ask those critical questions beneath the surface, sometimes the conclusions you arrive at are conclusions that say that in order for us to really begin to address the issues that are negatively impacting white people and poor people in this country, that we have to take a real serious look at how this society is organized. We have to look at it culturally. We have to look at it politically. We have to look at the way in which it is organized economically. And when we do that, we might come to the conclusion, like I came, that we have to really make some uh, fundamental changes, some what people might call radical changes, in order to really have social justice. So, you know, what that suggests, Tim, is that we can't continue to kind of tinker with the, the, the economy and the social structures, that we've got to uh, look at these things um, with, with new eyes and, and to try to be as creative as possible uh, in, in developing policies and programs that really get to the root of our problem. And that's what being a radical is, trying to get to the root of the problem. So, you know, radical change in terms of, of the kind of values that we are going to uphold in this society. Radical change in terms of, of what kind of democracy we really need to build in this country to make sure that everyone has a voice. You know, radical change in terms of what kind of planet are we going to live on when we have uh, millions of people and we have uh, an elite, uh, on the Republican side at least, that doesn't even recognize the, the climate crisis that we are in. Radical change in terms of, of the fact that even with the Affordable Care Act, we still have millions of people who don't have any access to health care. We still have millions of young people in this country that are still are being exposed to an inadequate education, an education that does not allow them to fully develop themselves as human beings. You know, radical change in terms of, of having real social security, not just when you become an elder, but throughout life. Wow. Radical change in the sense that we don't have to have insecurity as part of our life and anxiety, that we need to have uh, jobs that pay a living wage and gives us dignity. So these are the kind of things that we, we look at and we say that, you know, we have to have real change in this country. We can't, we can't play with folks and we can't pretend uh, otherwise, in my opinion. You know, I, I asked you that question, but I am so, I'm so with you on that. You know, I just know this is something we need to address because what's being put out in the mainstream, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Mr. Baraka, mm -hmm. you know, they, this incrementalism, this uh, yep. we need to just yep. do the tinkering around the edges and that whole that whole mindset. I think we need a radical shift, like you said, I'm using your word. We need a radical shift from that. And I love the fact that the Green Party, you and Joe Stein, offer a stark contrast to what's you know what's prevalent right now in this election season. I mean, there is no yep. denying that. Your philosophies are totally different than, say, Hillary Clinton's or Donald Trump's or, or, or Gary Johnson's. And I think that's I think that is something that uh, people need to recognize. But it's just making them understand that these are doable and that the time is now. That's my biggest thing. So how do we how do we get people? That's this is what I come up against. How do we get people to embrace the moment now and say, hey, this the, the urgency is now. And let's do it. Let's make the change to green. 
Well, you know, we have to have to engage people, Tim. We have to uh, deal with the fact that the the, the politics of, of fear is real. Yeah. Uh, people are very concerned about um, um, uh, Donald Trump and the kind of dark forces that he represents. Um, and so it, the Democrats under Hillary have been quite successful in sort of uh, keeping people uh, herded on the on the Democrat uh, plantation, if you will, you know. And, and but we can't we can't dismiss that because they, those concerns are real. What we try to tell people is that, you know, if you look at what's coming down the line from the Republican side, look at who's in the queue. You have people who are even more scary, more radical than Donald Trump. Mm. And then we say, we look at the other side, look at the Democrats, and you see the direction of Democratic politics moving to the right, perhaps at a slower pace. The question becomes, when do we draw a line in the sand and say that we, the people, have to begin to build something for ourselves? Mm. And if not now, when? When do we, when do we vote a principle uh, over, over fear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what I've been saying. That's what I've been saying. I, and I would think it would be uh, just logical. It's like right now, with the two, we have the two least liked candidates in the history of candidates. And that's not just my opinion, Ajamu. That's that's based on the polling. That's based on like the 11% trust ratio that Hillary right. has. And I say, like, if we don't do it now, when will we do it? This is this is the time for the for the third party to emerge. This is time for the Green Party to to really. Um, time is overdue. Don't get me wrong, but now, now with these two candidates, uh, those people who are apprehensive, now is the time to make the move. What What do you think with your human rights experience? What do you think about the Dakota Access Pipeline, and what's the solution? For those those folks who are impacted by these government policies, for our indigenous people, you know, Tim, let, let me let me let me come to that, but let me make a quick comment on, on your question. Okay. I think, uh, your comment, which I think is very very important in terms of the timing, and and, and my, my response to that is that, you know, one of the things that we we saw from the Sanders uh, challenge was that we saw the potential. We saw what we saw the polling that was taking place. They indicated that uh, the one individual that could uh, build, big, beat Donald Trump without um, uh, much difficulty Breaking the was sweat. Bernie Sanders. That's right. It indicated that there were people in this country who, who are, in fact, ready for some real change. Now, we know what happened in terms of, of Sanders attempting to you know, keep his word to, uh, to the Democrats. Uh, by supporting the uh, nominee, uh, even though uh, the WikiLeaks uh, um, uh, emails wow. uh, that were uncovered uh, de- demonstrated that uh, the system was rigged from the very beginning. Right. Uh, but in in supporting uh, Hillary Clinton, he basically kind of shut down that revolutionary process. So the potential was there. And if people were ready and are ready to step outside of the Democratic fold and really take a chance, the the numbers suggest that we that in a three or four uh, four person race we can get a plurality of the votes, Tim, and we can actually win. You know, we we had a chance. We got we we penetrated the mainstream media uh, for the last couple of weeks. That's why we've been so busy. You know, and so we just started getting our our message out uh, to the people, uh, and if we can get our message out, if we can get into those debates, if we're trying to open up that process and, and try to avoid that artificial barrier of 15%. If we can get into debate, if, if, if uh, Dr. Stein can get into the presidential debate, if I can get into that uh, vice presidential debate and we can really uh, show what we are trying to advocate for, I think we can make some significant progress. Yeah. I just wanted to say that. No, no, no. That's 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 uh, excellent. That's um, I, I wonder, I just imagine what that would look like, uh, someone with your substance, with Dr. Jill Stein's substance on the stage with those counterparts, uh, that that would be a day of reckoning, I believe, uh, Ajamu. They, uh, it would be very interesting. Oh, yes. Very interesting. I mean, it would it would change politics in this country for for a long time, and that's why they that's why they they're going to try to prevent it. But you know, uh, 
the people are, are clamoring for for the debate to be opened up, and so we are, we are working hard to try to uh, to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm you know I, I'm hoping that uh, w- w- is it true we need to get to what we need to get to the polling of what fifteen percent I think it is. Fifteen percent is the is that, that artificial right um, um, area, yeah. It, it's, and, it, it, and it's yeah. artificial, and it's it's difficult because it, 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 if you if you don't have access to the people, then you can't really get to fifteen percent, and that's why they put that put that that barrier there. Right. Um, and so if we can just get access, we can we can get some support, but you know we can't get support until we get access. So it's like this this kind of catch twenty two that it we is. have. It is. It is. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Um, so, so Tim, yeah. back to your question, though, in terms of what's happening with the uh, Dakota pipeline, you know, that to me is another example of why we have to have uh, progressive alternatives. Uh, here we have, here we are in 2016, and the indigenous people of this land are still attempting to fight uh, and have to fight in order to protect the integrity of of, of their lands, uh, the health of their people, uh, from the encroachment of uh, of, of of this government uh, that they've had to deal with now for uh, a few hundred years. Um, and they are involved in a, a very courageous fight. And I was so uh, proud uh, wow. when I saw the images yeah. of the uh, members of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, show up on horseback to join the, the demonstration. I think that was, that was a very powerful uh, image, a very powerful moment. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, um, I, I did you see that? Did yeah, you, see you know, I didn't know they showed up on horse on horseback. I I knew that they were involved, <laughs> and in D.C., there, you know, the the diversity of the support was was uh, across the board. And actually, I had a show, Jama, where um, we had some folks come in from a call in from the Sioux Reservation, uh, from the Sioux Clan, mm-hmm. and they uh they they spoke about their issues and uh what they were you know they were doing some dirty tricks, Jama. They were uh Cutting off, uh, cutting off the grid, so to speak, putting them in the dark, uh, cutting off the cell towers, cell access, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. a lot, lot of dirty things went on, um, mm-hmm. just, just horrible. And that's one of the questions one of my callers wanted me to ask you. That's why I went to it so quickly. Um, you know, part of what I run up against, because because I'm a strong advocate for the Green Party and for you, for Dr. Stein and yourself, uh, is I want I don't want people. I want to tell them we need to do this. We need to vote green because I need to make sure that my son has the alternative to the Democrat Party and Republican parties. But I'm also mm. hesitant to say because they're like, well, you got to. It's like I have to almost prove to them that we can win this election for them to feel, uh, you know, confident in that vote. And I'm not sure how to answer mm. that. And maybe I'm, I'm sure that I got a lot of callers tonight or listeners who feel the same way. I, I don't know how we can express yep. what's the game plan for, 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 for 50 states. So how many ballots are you guys on? What's the likelihood? What do we need to do to make sure that we can get on that ballot? We're going we're gonna to probably be on at least 47, on the ballots of 47 states, if not 48. Uh, so we, we, we are going to be there, there for people to, to have a choice. Uh, something that everybody should have in a in a democracy. Right. Uh, but we we understand people's uh, uh, reluctance. You know, stepping out and and, and doing something uh, bold and outside of what is uh, the status quo is, you know, it, it's a difficult thing sometimes. You know, but it's it's something that has to happen. You know, when 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 uh, those black folks led by black women uh, in, in 1955 in Montgomery decided that. You know, they, they, they were tired of, of, of sitting on the back of the bus and that they were not going to ride those buses, which meant that they had to get to work the best way they can for more than a year. That was a bold action. Yeah. And they were told that, that that wasn't going to be successful, that sooner or later you're going to break, that the, the powers that be are too great. You know, so, but they stepped out there and we know the consequences. It spearheaded a uh, movement across the South to, uh, and uh, to bring real democratic uh, reform and real democratic rights uh, to our people for the first time in the history of this country. So, you know, you got to step out sometimes. And, you know, we, we have a, a small 
percentage of the of the American people with us right now. But we know we have a whole lot of people who are sympathetic. Um, and we tell people that, you know, we are we understand that this is a long term struggle. Right. And that, you know, we we we, we understand uh, the reluctance but we say, you know, uh understand that, you know, to live a life and to live with dignity, one has to live by principles. You can't just live by fear. And, you know, when they talk about what would happen with a Donald Trump win or whatever, right. just remember this. Remember this, that basically Donald Trump or anybody else cannot suppress or defeat for long an organized and committed people who have a vision around what they need to do in order to be really free. You know, so if a Donald Trump was a win or whoever, there's still going to be resistance. I still believe in the people. And so, you know, we have an opportunity now with these two candidates who are the most unlike, as you said earlier, of any two candidates who ever ran. Uh, we know that the numbers are in our favor in terms of the people who uh, would, 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 would try a, uh, a real progressive alternative. Uh, and we just want to have be in a position to give people uh, a, a choice and we say you know uh vote your principles and, and that's your fear <laughs> yes definitely definitely just getting them to actually uh <laughs> actually wake up and realize that they do have this option and it's right there just got to reach out and sort of take hold of it um uh, and then we, we have yeah. to have that option because see there are things that that, that we have to talk about that that really di that distinguish us from the two parties you know, you, you were saying uh, earlier in your comments, and I was just listening, you know, you said you raised a re the rhetorical question, why can't we have a war against war? <laughs> but that's, that was a profound statement. Because you, 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 you recognize that basically this, the situation we have now where people are getting to a point where they are accepting that war is a viable option and people are not even questioning it anymore. We've got to, to wake people up to the fact that, you know, we don't have to have these conflicts with these various nation states that we're being told are our enemies and are a threat to uh, uh, the way of life in the U.S. You know, we've got to look at these things more critically. You know, we don't need to have a situation where we have thousands of our young people who, are, who go off to these conflicts who are thinking that they are defending the U.S., Right. And come to, come to find out that basically, basically they are involved in the occupation project, and they are then forced to do some pretty horrible things sometimes, and it's very difficult for them to live with that. So that we have a situation now, Tim, and I'm a veteran, where we have more veterans who have committed suicide yeah. over the last six years than who died in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan. And that's incredible. It is. And people talk about how they love the veterans and respect the vets, but they don't talk about that. Now, we've got to do something about, you know, the normalization of war. Uh, the, the, this, the, this attempt by the, by the U.S. to, to uh, convince people that the U.S. has some kind of God-given right to intervene any place it wants to around the world to determine what government is legitimate and what government is illegitimate to police the entire world? No, no. And to be in, to intervene wherever it, it thinks it it, can, it should intervene. No, we have to have a commitment to international law and international morality, and that's what the Green Party ticket uh, provides. We say we have to have uh, peace, a uh, peace offensive. We have to use the power of the state to bring about real national reconciliation in all of these conflicts where the U.S. is presently involved. We just can't withdraw because U.S. intervention has helped create the chaos we right. see in many of these countries. Yes. So what we have to do now is to figure out a way to have real reconciliation and a real peaceful resolution of these various conflicts. That's what we offer uh, on the Green Party ticket. Different from both parties. Yeah, v vastly different, <laughs> vastly different. We yeah. we've got uh with what the neoliberals and and you know right now headlines right now we're looking at you know the the issue of the uh, pharmaceuticals. I think I talked about that in the in the opening. Um, 
yes. I, I don't know what your feelings are about how do we regulate how do we keep these these corporations from raising prices on on goods and services that you know that could mean life or death for our citizens do you have an opinion on that <laughs> well I'm gonna tell you Tim, my personal opinion yes, is not the party it's not the campaign or the party position and that is that some of these major industries that have that have worldwide tentacles and which have demonstrated that their main objective is to the pursue pursuit of profit uh, over the the interests of the people right. that those uh, industries those companies the way we get them to uh, to to address the real needs of the people is that we maybe we ought to take take those 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 companies over <laughs> maybe they, they should maybe they, they should be publicly owned so that their activities uh, are, are re re uh, oriented toward uh, satisfying the real needs of the people. Why should pharmaceutical companies have the ability to be able to patent uh, stuff that they have discovered from from nature? Would have gone down to you know places in Latin America and Africa and 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 got people to share with them their secrets. And then they take that information back uh, and, and, and make some pills and then uh, charge everybody these exorbitant amounts of money for these medicines that should be free to all of us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, now, that's radical, Java. That's radical. Uh, <laughs> I can see some of them turning over right now, turning on, a, losing their minds. Here's exploding. Um uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking. I got a couple things from the news that I just I just want to know your take. But oh, I got to start with this though, John. There is some. There's something people have been talking about because you made a comment mm. about Obama, and I'm sure you're aware yeah. where I'm going. But if <laughs> I don't you. ask it, it'd be like Tim ain't keeping it real. What's right. this Uncle Tom reference? Is, was it out of context, or or or? How, let me just let you answer. I'm going to tell you what the, what the context was. <laughs> the context was, you know, one of those internal conversations among us that we have about certain things, you know? Right. This wasn't some comment that I made out to the general public, you know, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, Obama being on with Tom. This was uh, in the context of a conversation, uh, in, in a publication, an uh, interview uh, that we were having among ourselves. And I referenced the fact that uh, this individual, this president, who had, who came into office with all of these high expectations, uh, who had the opportunity to, in fact, be great if he would have attempted to live up just half of what he was uh, committed to, notwithstanding the opposition he supposedly got from Congress. But there was a lot of different things he, he could have done that would have addressed some of the the uh, aspirations of the people who supported him. And he could not have won, and you know this, Tim, he could not have won in 2008 or in 2012 without the significant support, the uh, 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 yeah. turnout of African-American voters. Yeah. Then the question becomes, objectively, what did we get, and really what did progressive people and poor people get from this administration? And the painful conclusion has to be that we get very little. That in fact, what we saw even from the very beginning of his of his of his term, we saw this 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 tendency to basically uphold and support the already existing structures of white power, a white supremacy. Let, let me share with you a quick story. You know, uh, in, in 2009, uh, the first few weeks, the first few months of 2009. Uh, we were uh, mobilized and going toward the 10th anniversary of the very important uh, uh, World Conference Against Racism t that took place down in Durban, South Africa in 2001. You know, historic conference. As you know, the Bush administration uh, walked out of that conference. Okay. Now, here we have the 10-year anniversary. Uh, get ready to happen up under a black president. Now, we understand he's the uh, president, and we know that there were some people who raised some issues about this conference, uh, and so they raised issues about the conference. Uh, he had some; they had some very specific uh, concerns. I was involved in in the uh, preparatory work 
for this this commemoration that's going to take place in Geneva, Switzerland, at the UN. We worked, and even though some of those things they wanted were really were unfair and unnecessary, we uh, worked and got everything that the Obama administration needed to have in order for the U.S. to participate in this world conference against racism. And he still decided to not participate and gave political cover, not just for the U.S., but gave political cover to all of the other racist uh, states on this planet that also decided that they weren't going to participate. You know, Canada, New Zealand, wow. you know, uh, uh, Australia, uh, the French, you know, the British, all of the European nations then decided they were going to, uh, they can, they can not be held accountable also because they have the political cover yeah. given by uh, Barack Obama. And the list goes on, Tim. I mean, why did the, the, the Department of Justice under uh, Barack Obama have to put a, a $2 million dollar a, a, a bounty on our dear sister Asata Shakur, you know? Right, right. Why? Why? Why was that necessary? You know? Why? Why? Why couldn't? Why? Why couldn't there be some more targeted and specific programs to deal with the the uh, astronomical unemployment rates in urban environments? Right. Right. Why couldn't they get that that uh, office of urban affairs together that they had to put in place that was supposed to be in charge of urban policy? Uh, they could never get it together because uh, there was no real interest and push and support from the White House. You know? Yes. What objectively did we get as a consequence of this? I mean, all we had was that basically Barack Obama also allowed for uh, for the for 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 the, the Brits, for the UK, the English, and the French to basically go into Africa and dismantle, destroy the uh, most prosperous country on the African continent, Libya. Right. And that opened up the floodgates for uh, all kinds of destabilization across the African continent. This was, this is pure, Tim, it was pure gangsterism. Yes. Because all they wanted was the Libyan, Libyan oil, but also what they wanted to was the fresh water in Libya. So what do we get? That, I mean, so if you are, if you basically are committed the upholding white power. If you are not doing anything within your power to basically make some even incremental changes, then you know, for me, you, you are a manifestation of uh, 21st century Uncle Tom. Wow. And I stood by and stand by that position. I love it. And he's not the only one. Uh, the vast majority right. of the, what we call the black misleadership class yes. is in that same category. Mm. Selling out our people, left or right, Selling out the uh, uh, selling out working class people uh, and poor people left and right for the crumbs they're getting from the table of the Democratic Party uh, and the and, and, and the oligarchy that runs this thing. Preach, preach, brother, preach, man. This is this is what I'm talking about. I had this conversation, uh, portions of this conversation with a friend yesterday, and their mouth dropped when I said, you know, that you, you made this reference about. Uh, Obama and I defended you and I tried to enlighten them. I said, look at the plight of black folks under Obama. It has not been mm. better. And I know that I know and they looked at me, Ojamu, uh, like uh like I had two heads or something. Like no, but I'm telling you, these are the facts. And though Trump is using this right now to try to pull in black voters, I'm I'm wondering what can we do to influence black voters um, Latino voters as well, all minority voters, uh, to wake up to the rules. Because I think it's the rules of John where he talked the talk. He knew that his by the by the the fifth the sheer fact that he was a black man that black folks were going to identify with him. Some Latinos as well. He did a lot of cool stuff, hanging out with Jay Z, but it was all a setup. Because meanwhile, he didn't do anything to to better the plight of those inner city people. Those people were predominantly uh, minority. And I'm like, what do I do? What do we need to do to to really make people wake up? Because they're not, they, it's t they got to wake up. They got to wake up. But Tim, let me tell you something. The, 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 the thing that really upset me, and, and I think that was what I was referring to that in that conversation also was. You know, we all know about what happened at, at uh, Mother Emanuel Church in uh, South Carolina yes. when Dylan Roof went in there and, and murdered uh, nine of our folks uh, in church. Now, 
what many people didn't didn't understand, didn't know, and I wrote a column on this, and that, that's why people get get mad at me because, see, I'm I'm an open book, Tim. I've been writing and talking stuff, you know, for quite some time, <laughs> you know, and, right. and and I, you know, and my I feel like my responsibility to speak truth to power, and that's what I do. Let the let the chips fall where they may. So I wrote a column. And I talked about the fact that, and I I was trying to wake people up. And, and me and somebody else, and I was saying, you know what? There was a uh, Department of Homeland Security report that came out in uh, in 2010, uh, latter part of uh, 20, uh, 2009, uh, 2010, in which there was an analysis that uh, uh, identified the number one domestic threats, domestic terrorist threats in the U.S. And guess what it concluded? It concluded that it wasn't uh, Muslim uh, uh, jihadists or Muslim terrorists. It was homegrown white nationalists, yeah. and specifically the lone wolf type. Okay? Right. Now, what happened was this, Tim. The Republicans, in this, in the, they kind of exposed themselves. They said that that report was biased against the Republican Party. Why is that? Is that they're your natural uh, uh, constituents? Yeah, they, are, I mean, they, are, yeah, they, so they, <laughs> they see themselves yeah, they in that was category. Yes, against, sir. Yeah, <laughs> they say it was a bias against against the Republican Party. It was a, a biased party because they say it was trying to suggest a connection between uh, right wing racist extremism and the Republican Party. And as a consequence of them raising those questions, the Obama administration pulled their report. It never got publicized. So my question was this: What if that, if they wouldn't have bent to though that 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 so-called pressure, what if they would have been committed to uh, educating the public on this potential threat like they should have been? And what if those folks in Mother Emmanuel's church would have been aware of the fact that, you know, we are open, we open up our arms to anybody who comes to who wants to worship, but we remember that uh, white young lone wolves are potentially dangerous so while we let him come in uh and worship uh let's keep an eye on this young man let's right. let's situate ourselves in such a way that if he's not there for the purposes he claimed to be then we know how to deal with that but they didn't do that tim because they didn't know because that report was pulled as a consequence of this little uh, little bs pressure put on the administration and the, what's the consequence? The folks died. So when I wrote that article, and people were just beginning to pick it up and and, and think about it and, and and criticize, Obama comes down to the uh, to the funeral, you know, and uh, sings our people to sleep with amazing grace. You know that that kind of uh, performative yeah. blackness that he's he's been able to perfect over the years. Right. You know. Right. So those are the kind of things that. That upset me, Tim. And then when I look at the fact that you you reference the fact that we have Black Lives Matter, and everybody who's listening to you knows about the, this this the, the, the killings that are taking place across this country. Somebody explain to me, as your listeners, explain to me why, with all of these murders, that the federal government, the Department of Justice under Barack Hussein Obama, has only found it uh, uh, to its, its 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 interest to only prosecute one of these killer cops, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's Walter Scott, and I think it was South Carolina. I think it was. Yes, that's it. That's the only one. Only one. Horrific, horrific. So y'all can y'all you know y'all can keep your Barack Obama as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need a Barack Obama. We got a, a Jamu Baraka. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go with that. We'll go with that. In in light of once again, I'm I'm in this position as well because uh, another question people have is Bernie Sanders. They said a Jamu Baraka had such harsh words for Bernie Sanders, and I haven't this I have not read. So I'm totally going to be educated by you on this. What are your feelings yeah. about Bernie Sanders? And what what was critical? What what was the critical statement about? Well, I, I think, like I, as I indicated earlier, I thought that the Bernie Sanders run was a very significant one. 
um, it, it demonstrated that there's real potential for us to change here in the U.S. My my and, and and believe me, I wanted to feel the burn, and I was in fact uh, in contact with uh, uh, members of the of the Bernie campaign uh, at the very beginning, but I couldn't I couldn't pull the trigger, Tim, because you know there was I saw some tendencies there that I was really concerned about. Uh, you know, I didn't think that that uh, uh, Brother Bernie was going to break from the Democratic Party, and I guess uh, that turned out to be uh, to be true. The other concern I had was that, you know, in just focusing in on domestic policy and being relatively silent on foreign policy, and then when he was, uh, when he did comment about foreign policy, some of his positions were positions that as a, a, a black person, as a black internationalist, I, was, I had real concern with. And so I had to raise the question as to, what the implications were, and this is what I was dealing with specifically. I, I raised the, the, the issue with uh, uh, Sanders, and that's so much his supporters, but and I, I kind of raised the question with them too, because uh, I wanted this campaign to be as effective as it, it could be. I said, why can't we have a truly progressive candidacy? Why can't we have one that both uh, embraces uh, positive and forward-thinking domestic policy, but also foreign policy? Right. Why does Bernie have to embrace the illegal drone war of Barack Obama and, in fact, becoming, if he was to become president, another uh, uh, war criminal, in essence? That wasn't necessary. The people were ready for real change. It wasn't necessary, Bernie. Why is it that Bernie Sanders talks about uh, that, um, you know, the Saudis needed to be the ones to take the lead in, in, in combating terrorism? Uh, in the Middle East and other parts of the world, when we all know who follow this stuff, that is the, the radical Wahhabism uh, that's supported financially by the Saudis, that is the ideological base of the jihadist movement around the world mm. without any real constraints imposed on them by the U.S. government. So their hands are already dirty. We know that, that the Saudis' hands are dirty in, in, in Syria. We know that the Saudis' hands were dirty in Egypt and the coup in Egypt that took place. We know that the Saudis' hands are dirty and dripping with blood in Yemen that nobody talks about. And so many people don't even know about, you know, with the full support of the U.S. They've been waging a brutal and illegal war uh, in, 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 Yemen, in Yemen for the last uh, nine months. So it's like, uh, Bernie, you, you can't do that, you know, and you can't. You know, say that you are concerned about black lives mattering in the uh, U.S. and not be concerned about the lives of, of people in Yemen That's or true. the lives of people yeah. in Syria. That's true. And, that, and what that implies in terms of, of talking about the Saudis being, you know, taking their hands dirty, is this, oh, this kind of old colonialist sort of mentality that let the natives fight, fight among themselves. We don't need to be involved, you know. And I said that is fundamentally a white supremacist position. And I was asking his fan, his, his supporters, supporters, to uh, to not go down that road. It was not necessary, and it was unprincipled. I hear you. Now, I hear you. Yeah. People, but people, Tim, who were serious about really uh, real, you know, revolutionary change, mm -hmm. you know, and who understood what I was saying in, in terms of the critique of the potential white supremacy in those positions, they didn't have a problem with it, including people like. Uh, Dr. Cornel West, right. who you know is one of the most visible supporters of, of Bernie Sanders. In fact, uh, you know, and, and so where is, where is uh, Dr. West today? He's with us. <laughs> He's with us at CNN. He's with me in Houston, you know, when, when I accepted the nomination. He's, he's with us all the way because he's mature enough to understand that we have these kind of critiques among ourselves, but the objective is for us to be better and more principled, you know? And, and we're at, that's what we have to do. If people are serious about real change in this country, you know, you can't be afraid of engaging in real serious critique. You, you can't be afraid of criticism, you know, because the objective is for us to transcend this and to be better. And we can't be better if we can't be honest. <laughs> that, is, that is real. That is so real. That's so real. You know, right now, what's in the what's in the news headlines? They're talking about this football player from the uh, 49ers who who wouldn't stand up to yeah. salute the flag until he says he sees some change. 
and how we deal with police shootings and unarmed citizens. Is this a bunch of crap or what? I don't know. I just want your opinion on this. See, um, uh, what do you, what do you think about that whole uh, nationalism, patriotism? Looks like a black man can't can't be a patriot in, in their opinion. Well, you know, it, well, you know that that's that is a very interesting kind of conversation. One I think we need to have it, have honestly. Um, I think the brother has all the the right in the world to express his self in that way. I think that the conversation that is generating is a good conversation because. You know, one one of the thing, other things they tried to hit me on was, you know, my uh, uh, position that basically the only way we're going to build a new society in the U.S. is that we've got to uh, uh, disconnect, de-link from this uh, kind of historical narrative that, uh, you know, this this uh, our founding fathers and the uh, pursuit of the more perfect nation and and the, the you know uh, moving across the nation and selling the nation and this is such a wonderful thing. No, you know if we don't uh, respect <laughs> the experiences of all people wow. in this country and this 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 experience here in the yeah. U.S., yeah. we can't uh, look at how this how this looked from the vantage point of the indigenous people who watched these uh, settlers move from the East Coast all the way across their territory shooting and killing and enslaving them, you know, for a hundred years. And we can't remember the fact that, you know, we didn't show up here uh, on the, on the Mayflower ourselves. We showed up here in the bowels of ships and we have a perspective and our perspective may not be the same as the perspective of some white middle-class person who's a great grandfather or grandfather mother came over here uh, through Ellis, Ellis Island, you know, and then we've got to disconnect from that, that, that fantasy, that 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 fairy tale of U.S. exceptionalism, wow. you know, that we can't build a new society based on a bunch of nonsense. These founding fathers, these founding uh, rapists, who right. basically uh, raped and and, and 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 mutilated people because they all were slave owners. No, no, no. We don't have to embrace that history. We have another history of struggle, a principal fight back. There were people who fought against the uh, U.S. Uh, experiment, you know. So, right. you know, we don't have yes. to be forced to always do this performative patriotism kind of thing. We fought in every conflict this, this country's been involved in. And what was the consequence? We come back after World War One. what happened? No we had uh, murdered and lynched across the country. Right. We come back after World War II, uh, the fight against uh, racism and Nazism in Europe. What happened? We got to fight and 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 get and subjected to uh, lynchings across the country. Segregation. We go to Vietnam, mm -hmm. Korea, the same kinds of things. Right. No, no, no. We don't have to prove anything to anybody. Wow. You know. Wow. Yeah. It, it sounds like you, you you want Americans to wake up and tell the truth. I'm just seeing their heads explode right now, even thinking about because uh, it's so embedded in our in our. Uh, in our politics, like in our movies, in our media, you know, our pop culture is just built on uh, this this, this uh, worshiping of police, this worshiping of the military, um, that we're always doing things for the for the greater good, and and it would be a total shift, I think, a job for people, and I think it needs to happen. Don't get me wrong; it, it definitely needs to happen. Like that's the only way. That's what I try to do every day is make people wake up to the realities. Um, like poverty, even their own circumstances. I get frustrated with the job, but maybe you have some words of wisdom on it, but the, the fact that all the people that are suffering in poverty, white, black, Latino, Asian, the, you know, what we're dealing with, and they're still buying into the corporate, mainstream BS. What Jim is, is understandable because it, 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 is, it is, people are bombarded through all of our major social institutions all of our major communication institutions and structures to basically right. buy into and assimilate the dominant set of ideals, the dominant ideology, you know, and that ideology is one that um, is, is completely committed to uh, the fantasy of uh, get rich or die trying of materialism, you know, yes. of, of, of your, your, your humanity, your value as a human being is reflected and what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, what kind of clothes you're wearing, 
you know, and if that is your definition of your uh, your value as a human as as a human, then that's what you pursue in order to to feel that you exist and to try to win recognition. We have to shift those kinds of values, but it's difficult when you are socialized into those kind of values from the time you're able to to think and hear things, you know. But you know that's our task because we're not going to be able to wake people up to the fact that it is the very values they have that are tying them into a system that cannot really uh, address their real needs. That are not going to result in them uh, getting the kind of riches and wealth that they think they should have, uh, and that if they, you know, if they if, and they can't, you know, get it by legitimate means, you know, they then will then pursue illegitimate means, which ends up uh, with uh, our folks in, involved in this mass incarceration process. You know, we got to break people away from those kind of values, but it's tough because these are the dominant uh, ideals, the dominant values, the dominant ideology uh, in this country. But there's there's hope, Tim, because you know you look at the polling among young people and uh, of all races, and people are really raising some serious questions yes. about the values of this country. Serious questions about about uh, the values of capitalism and competition uh, and accepted inequality, you know, and individualism. You know, those things are now being seriously questioned, and that's why, again, the Sanders folks. And the Sanders campaign has such great potential because he was talking about uh, democratic socialism, even though, you know, he, he could have, you know, gone a lot, a lot further. But at least people were uh, exposed to that term and, and right. looked it up and started thinking about it and talking that's about right. it. And that's right. the kind of changes we have to have here in this country. That's what we're doing with this campaign, Tim. The, the, the objective of this campaign is to engage the American people to talk about these kind of things to look at the kind of policy we believe that we need to have as a as a transition program. You know, you, you were saying earlier about, you know, you know, the, the, you know, whether or not your grandkids are going to be able, even able, be able to live. You know, if we don't transform uh, the economy and this society to a green economy and green uh, commitment to, to social relations, we're not going to survive. You know, so when we talk about we want to generate 20 million uh, uh, new jobs, clean uh, energy jobs in the energy right. sector. You know that's that's significant, and we believe we can do that. We believe that we can we can move this 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 economy uh, away from its dependency on on fossil fuels and all of this dirty uh, uh, energy. Uh, we believe that we have to do that because we have no other choice. Uh, but I think that. The main message here is that, you know, we have to uh, uh, talk about the future. And I was, what I was referencing was, in fact, that, uh, you know, going back to one of our policy proposals, is that we need to be committed to, uh, you know, real change. And one of the change, changes we have to be committed to is, is shifting the economy uh, and, and creating new kinds of jobs, um, you know, jobs and, and clean energy. Uh, and jobs that where we, when we make that shift uh, and, and we think we can do this, uh, there, there is a targeted jobs program also that's going to be targeting uh, low-income um, uh, communities so that people can make a transition from, you know, uh, the kinds of, of, of jobs that now have been created over the last uh, eight years, um, many service sector jobs, low-wage jo jobs, uh, we can begin to move people to, you know, uh, solar and wind and water, uh, energy sources and, and jobs, you know, uh, the construction of, 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 of homes and apartments uh, that, that, are, that use natural um, uh, materials. Uh, you know, there's so much uh, create creativity that we can employ. You know, if we're able to free people up uh, to be creative and to, to utilize the, the natural resources we have in our environment and we can protect our environment, you know, and we can make this shift to uh, an economy in which, you know, we are not only using our natural resources and, and engage in clean energy production, uh, but that we are engaged in consumption that's in align, alignment with, the, with Mother Earth, that we're not over-consuming, over that, you know, we've got to understand that 
some of us who live in the North, and we talk about the North meaning in the U.S., in Western Europe, uh, where we collectively make up just 10% of the global population. So it's unsustainable for that 10% to be consuming almost 40% of the resources of this planet. You know, so these kinds of shifts and these kinds of conversations around what kind of society, what kind of people are we going to be in the future, how are we going to relate uh, to the earth and our natural resources, these are the kinds of conversations we want to have uh, with people throughout the next two months of this campaign. And we believe that we have those conversations and, and show them that we have some real alternatives to what is the status quo and that we're serious about this. Uh, I think people will seriously give us some consideration uh, now uh, and or in the future because what we have to say also to Tim, this is not just about me and, and Jill at the top of the ticket. We have a Green Party candidates running on every mm. level of government. Many of them have very little resources, but they have but they have great ideas and they are committed to serving the people. People need to seek out those candidates, you know, and, uh, and, and ninety and seconds. Important. You know, it's time for it's time for a change, Tim. It's time for a revolution. And let's let's come off this uh, this two party uh, monopoly. And 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 black folks need to consider coming off this uh, this democratic uh, plantation, especially now that it's clear that the Clinton folks are building a new kind of alignment politically, yes. in which black folks and poor people are going to be even more marginalized. Absolutely. Absolutely. That move to the right. That move to the right. He's been talking 60 about guys. Seconds. Yes, sir. Definitely, definitely. Well, Ajamu, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out once again. Don't you worry. I will have uh, the I will I will add the audio from the uh, from the from the call in network that you're on to this video, and I'll I'll put mm -hmm. it together. You'll be just fine. And we'll I think we're going to get a lot more people who watch the post as opposed to watching it live anyway because. Um, yes. Yeah, that's how I can actually share it with more people. We're going to reach thousands with this broadcast, and I'm just so glad that you were able to make time out your schedule for this to happen, sir. Well, I, I really appreciate this, Tim, and like I said, I'm I'm a fan of yours. And um, anytime you want me back, just uh, just give me the, give me the word, brother, and I'll be there. Man, I appreciate you, ladies and gentlemen, Ajamu Baraku. Vice Presidential Candidate from the Green Ten Party, seconds. guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Give it up for my friend, Ajamu. Wow, amazing.